I'm Zara Patel, for anyone that doesn't know me, and we're gonna talk about avoiding complications in sinus surgery today. I have the mic on because we're being recorded. It seems a little much for this room, but that's what they want, so that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> All right, so my esteemed panelists, uh, include Dr. Nyack, who all of you, I think, know here in the department. He is one of our rhinologists um, and leader of our research division within rhinology. And um, Karen Fong has joined us from California Sinus Sensors. She's in Walnut Creek. Uh, and uh, I have known Dr. Fong since I was a medical student at OHSU, so we have a relationship that goes way back as well. So thank you both of you for joining me today, and hopefully soon, Mike Asaste from the Valley will join us, and Peter Wong from our own division will join us as well. Here are our relevant disclosures. So when you start thinking about sinus surgery, we perform over 250,000 sinus surgeries every year in the United States, and that's probably a low estimate. That's from some years back, and it just keeps climbing as we get more tools and people become more comfortable and are better trained at doing sinus surgery. And overall, our complication rates are very low. Um, they range in the literature from five to 30%, but if you're talking about major complications, it's less than 3%. But rhinology claims represent 70% of all total indemnity comp compensation in otolaryngology. So when you look at that number, it might um, make you think that, well, number one, there's pretty bad complications that can happen when you do sinus surgery. We're working around really important structures, right, like the brain and the eye. Um, but so are the rest of ENT surgeons. So why are our claims so much higher? And it may be that the idea of sinus surgery being an elective surgery for a quality of life problem that isn't usually a life or death issue, perhaps the disconnect between patients going into that surgery perhaps not being uh, informed about all of the possible risks, and then what can possibly happen after may be why there is such a widespread in that, that number. So there's all sorts of complications that we're gonna talk about. We can talk about anosmia, intracranial complications, septal perforations and abscesses, orbital complications. We're not gonna have time to touch on everything, but those are some of them. And the good news is that because of endoscopic skull base surgery, we now have learned techniques that allow us to handle and manage uh, a lot of the complications of sinus surgery much more effectively. So there's different types of complications like immediate, which are catastrophic. This is an example of a patient who presented to an outside ENT. This was their scan. After they had their surgery, they came to our center and this was their imaging. And you can see that, unfortunately, they had uh, damage to the carotid artery on that side. Thankfully for them, they had a sentinel bleed and did not have a huge carotid blowout, so they were able to go to the interventional radiology suite. They found this aneurysm there, and they were able to stent it. However, during that procedure, they stroked. So even, even when that uh, was found afterwards, they didn't have a great outcome. Here's another example of a patient who presented to an outside uh, physician. They had this retention cyst in their maxillary sinuses. They decided to go ahead and address that. The patient came to us looking like this after that surgery. And on their imaging at our center, you could see that not only did they have violation of the orbit, their optic nerve was completely taken and they still have that cyst in place. So these are the types of things that are really, you know, undefensible. You can also have delayed complications, uh, which may not seem as big a deal, but may for a patient seem like a bigger problem. This is a patient who came to us after having had sinus surgery on the outside, and you can see they basically had uh, all the middle terminates resected in the middle of their nose, maybe a little bit hole in their septum there, and then uh, this is what their frontal sinuses look like after their surgery. So although certainly I can do a draft three and open up that frontal, their main complaint was total loss of smell after that procedure, and I can't bring back their olfactory epithelium. So unfortunately, that's something that you have to think about. So now that Dr. Wong has joined us, we, <laughs> we can continue, and what we're gonna talk about is really avoiding complications both in the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative settings. So let's get right to it, and please use your microphone as we're being recorded. 
what do you guys think about when you're thinking about either in your practices or probably in other practices and see your excellent surgeons? What are the main factors that lead to poor outcomes in sinus surgery? Well, I think for me, one of the um, really important things, and I think you kind of touched on this, is that because for a lot of these patients, this is an elective procedure, um, I think a big part of it is setting the right expectations, um, selecting the right patients, um, making sure that the complaints that the patients have and what you see as the issue kind of jive together. Um, because if you have a patient who has, you know, a, a, a bunch of sinus problems, but they have no complaints or very minimal complaints, um, I think you're kind of setting yourself up for, you know, potentially a poor outcome because you might not be able to correct the issue that bothers the patient the most. Uh, I, I have a lot of issues with that when patients come in and they're filled with nasal polyps. And it's very impressive. And as a surgeon, you think, oh, I can help this patient. But their only complaint is that they can't smell. And they want to know, you know, what their chance of getting their sense of smell is. They don't complain about congestion or infections or pressure or post-nasal drip or any of those things. They only complain that they want their sense of smell back. And I think you, you know, have to, if you do excellent surgery, and you you know um, do a, a really you know do a great job, but they still don't get their sense of smell back, which they may not. They may be very unhappy um, afterwards. So I think setting expectations is is important. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel and uh, speak uh, with all of you and um, and. Um, uh, give my opinion on some of these questions. So um, if I think it depends, this question depends on what we define as outcomes. Um, so just for this question, I'll just say just in terms of outcomes for mucociliary clearance, how do we um, uh, pr uh, provide better mucociliary clearance and better uh, drainage to the sinuses? For most patients, they want to feel better when ter with regard to those major and minor symptoms that we talk about uh, to our trainees. Um, Worse, uh, lessened uh, facial pain, facial pressure, discharge, things like that. But I think that the the, the top two, I think, in my opinion, offhand, uh, would be technical. The the, the that you ha you're going to have a bad outcome in sinus surgery if technically you don't um, know exactly where the OSI are uh, to each of the sinuses. Um, and know how to open them adequately, and know how to open them um, with the right instruments, um, and uh, either widely enough or uh, adequately for that patient, um, and also deal with other aspects of sinus surgery. There's middle turbinate control. There's aspects of uh, making sure the nasal septum stays straight after you correct it. Um, making sure your turbinates are, if you've, uh, if your turbinates, make sure that they've stayed reduced, things like that, that'll uh, technically uh, mean success, that the way you've left them in the operating room is the way that they appear weeks to months later in your office. And then I think um, sometimes, no matter what you do, you can be as technically savvy and excellent and trained as, 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 uh, as you can be, but if they have um, poor, 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 poor protoplasm, um, they have an autoimmune disease, they have Wegener's granulomatosis or GPA, uh, cystic fibrosis or um, one of these primary ciliary dyskinesia, this, uh, you know, you can do the absolutely best technical operation uh, with the most advanced equipment, um, and they're going to come back with purulence and scarring and and a need for revision surgery sometimes uh, within a year, within two years, things like that. So um, it's a mix of what the, you can do technically to optimize the situation and also um, what you can do given their background. There's nothing left to say. <laughs> No, I would say that, uh, I mean, I definitely agree with everything that Dr. Fong and Dr. Nayak said. Uh, just, I was going to start with the corollary to the structural issues, which are the physiologic issues, and I think that, you know, that is something we always have to keep in mind, that even though we we aim to solve the anatomic issues and the structural issues, that chronic sinusitis is an inflammatory disease, so how do we think that we can fix an inflammatory disease by doing surgery? So. 
you know, I, what I would add to just the discussion is in, in addition to identifying <clears throat> the broad etiologies like cystic fibrosis, Wegener's, and autoimmune, there's, of course, the, of all the patients that don't do well, probably 70, 80 percent of those cases, we don't actually have a specific diagnosis to give them. But we actually have more and more evidence um, that's coming out that helps us predict who those people are. And I think that what I encourage you to do is to be current with the literature to be, know how to apply those. So, for example, you know, peripheral eosinophilia, if you do a blood draw, that's predictive um, of worse outcomes, or tissue eosinophilia. So if you have specific ways of looking at your histology from your from your um, intraoperative specimens, that's also predictive. And there, it's not just as, it still is a black box, but there's more that we can say, you know, with regard to choosing the right patient. If somebody comes back, you know, we all do the SNOT-22 every single visit for our, uh, in our practice, and part of it now is not just for research, but actually if somebody has a SNOT-22 of 21 or less, that's been shown that they're not going to have as great, great a degree of um, satisfaction with their outcome than somebody higher. So these are very practical um, applications of the research that we do. And so that would be my addition to the comments is not just to throw your hands and go, I just don't know what to do anymore, but to actually keep up with the literature to understand how to incorporate these findings into, in a very practical way to the way that you counsel patients and treat patients. Excellent answers. So you guys touched on all these things that I kind of thought about also. So underlying disease process, I think, is a lot of what was just discussed. So whether it's um, really bad polyps or cystic fibrosis or Wigner's or tissue eosinophilia, that has a lot to do with how the outcomes of your surgery are going to be. And so that's something to think about and consider. And then also patient misunderstanding, exactly what um, Dr. Fong mentioned, you know, if, they, if the patient thinks that the point of doing surgery is not what you think the point of your doing surgery for. That disconnect is going to lead to a poor outcome in the patient's mind. Maybe you think the surgery went great and you have a great outcome, but that's not what the patient's going to think in that situation. And then the things that might lead to the worst complications that we kind of touched on at the beginning are things like unidentified anatomic variants, obscured field from bleeding, distorted anatomy, inadequate access. And then as Jake Carr mentioned, inadequate training perhaps if a surgeon is doing a surgery that they are not well equipped to do, then that certainly can also lead to outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Saste, for joining us. I know you were caught in traffic and I appreciate you joining us now. So next question. At the very initial visit when a patient comes to see you, what are you doing or saying to avoid complications down the line? We're going to start with you, even though you just got here, <laughs> because we want to hear from someone new. Thank you, Zara. Um, so at my initial visit, I like to be very clear with a patient about what my expectations are for them to be adherent to a regimen. I have a lot of challenges with getting my patient to obtain their medications and uh, maintain blood pressure and do basic just stuff like that. So making sure that they have access to their medications, that they can be compliant and tolerant with them, that they have access to a primary care provider, um, that I've looked at their chronic narcotic use and I have an idea of what their post-op plan is for that and their sleep study if they've had it or their obesity and their stop bang. Um, and then I think trying to give them a very good sense of what to expect and what to plan for postoperatively, like my gardener can't go back to work um, and he needs to plan for at least two weeks off of work in order to, um, you know, not have that hemorrhage. So those are some of the more um, social things I think that are relevant to my practice. Nice. You can go on down the line, guys. Give me your two cents. Uh, review of medication is really important. Um, even supplements, ginkgo and things like that that can prolong bleeding. Uh, that was definitely a big deal in Oregon. We had a, a naturopathic, we had several naturopathic schools and lots of NDs as primary care doctors and so lots of people on supplements um, and other anticoagulants. So many people are on blood thinners for various reasons um, and having good communication with the uh, primary care physician um, regarding management of some of these things. Um, 
not to say that we have to practice defensive medicine, but I've actually been involved with medical legal cases where there were discussions with the primary care doctor about uh, bridging therapy for anticoagulation. And it was assumed that the primary care doctor was going to manage it. But the only documentation, there was no documentation, it was just a phone call. And the surgeon was still charged to be the captain of the ship. So even though it led to a um, cerebrovascular accident, um, they could not um, attribute it to the family practitioner. So again, just an awareness of those kinds of issues because those are very practical things, not to see you have to practice defensive medicine all the time, but documentation is very important for something like that. Yeah. Um, agree, of course, naturally with everything that's been said. Um, um, I'm kind of to touch upon the idea of the avoiding complication of avoiding ex the expectations complication. Um, I kind of, uh, I mean, we see a lot of complicated people naturally, all of us do. Um, I kind of, uh, they're already a little bit frustrated when they come to see you a little bit. They're a little bit um, um, anxious, um, um, concerned that, that this is going to happen to them again. And I do tell them that that what I'm going to try to provide for them and our team is going to provide them is, uh, is a foundation surgery. I'm going to try to give them an initial, let's just say, all eight sinuses, four on the left, four on the right, um, op you know, uh, foundation where all the sinuses will be opened and then we'll have to see how well we can keep your sinuses open. We're just not sure how much inflammation and infection uh, will work with us to keep everything as, again, as good as we've left it in the operating room. And so we might have to revise or work on one or two sinuses down the road, but then I think we've set the stage so that if we need to go back, then it's just in their head that we've already talked about some of these things. Um, and I think it's, it just leads to um, uh, just that, that, that idea that we're willing to work with you, we're, we're in it together for the long haul. These are patients that are going to be in your practice for months to years. Um, so I think uh, having that uh, willingness to admit that you winning, you're willing to do that and you're, uh, you have a, that they have a complicated problem, but you're willing to address complicated problems um, and you have to do it in certain staged ways sometimes, that's uh, important. Well, I don't think I have a whole lot to add to that. I totally agree with everybody's uh, comments, particularly about the um, going carefully over their um, preoperative medications and um, things like blood thinners, et cetera, and how are you going to manage those things postoperatively. I think um, kind of sticking with my theme about um, patient expectations, et cetera, I think one of the things um, I um, you know, I try to stress with patients too is setting the expectation that surgery doesn't always replace taking medications. I think, um, you know, if patients are um, on appropriate, you know, quote unquote, maximal medical therapy and you believe that they're going to need that as part of their ongoing treatment process, that you have to discuss with them the fact that they're going to have to keep doing those things and setting that expectation beforehand. Otherwise, you know, you may have patients where you do, again, you know, a very reasonable surgery. Um, but if the patient's expectation is that they can stop all their medications and you think that that's something they need to continue, like their topical steroids, et cetera, you know, I think they're going to have, um, you know, definitely poorer outcomes. Um, and I, I hear that a lot now. I, it seems like more and more patients come in and they want surgery because they say, well, I don't like to take medication. And um, for so many of our chronic patients, you know, it's a chronic issue and there are going to be medications that they need to continue taking. So I think that, you know, that's uh, something important to stress with them. Definitely. So I know that here at Stanford, we have a separate preoperative visit right before the actual surgery. I don't know if at the Valley or in your practice, Karen, if you guys have that, but uh, I'm going to direct this first just to Peter and Jaycar, who I know have it, and then you guys can chime in if you have anything to add. Is there anything different or new that you're going to think about at a preoperative visit um, just before the surgery to make sure that you're looking at or doing? Um, well, we have a great team, uh, thankfully, our, our fellows, our nurse practitioners, so um, they help us with making sure that these things are, you know, kind of checklists is done, but we make sure that they have... Um, as you many of you know, uh, the antibiotics, the steroids, all done ahead of time. The patients that love that, um, everything 
already in hand, so uh, they don't have to do that post-operatively. Um, but I also make sure that they have rinses um, pre-made, um, so they don't have to kind of worry about making them and uh, that they start doing them on post-op either the night of surgery or post-op day one and all throughout until their first visit. And also I tell them that 50% of your success is what we did in surgery, 50% is what you do at home for the rest of your for the rest of our time together, right? So we can only do every, either one is a failing grade without the other. So I try to do that in our, uh, in that preoperative counseling visit and then try to answer any questions. I've had my share of near misses over the years and I actually think you said there's a checklist, but we actually, I don't have a checklist and I often feel like we should. Um, things like, uh, I thought the patient had their scan, or they brought in a hard copy old school film, and we thought it was a disc, and we thought it had been uploaded, or the scan isn't compatible with navigation, or something else, and the morning of, we're like getting the patient in to get, you know, I mean, there's stuff like that that happens, and we just think, you know, there should be a better way to cover all of these things, because those are the avoidable side of complications. Um, so, uh, I do think, you know, there's the opportunity to see them and just review all that. And, and the other thing I do also do is I'm looking at the scans again. And I, whenever I have a resident with me, I think some of you have been with me, I tell you, I want you to go in and validate the surgery that we're going to offer this patient. Like, if you think that the patient deserves something different based on the scan, either more or less, I want to know about it. And that's your chance to really make sure, you know, just test it again. Is there something new that came up? Um, or is there something that you think we just glossed over and actually doesn't need to be treated? That's our chance. So that's another, that is an important um, pause there to kind of look at that. And then I think just in general, this isn't really speaking to what I'm doing to avoid complications, but you really don't want to be afraid to talk about complications. So patients would rather know more. I think Dr. Bond, is Dr. Bond here? No. Um, who did a study looking at, you know, patients want to know more. They want to know the catastrophic complications. They want to know about that, and it's it's okay to talk about those things, and you should. So um, I wouldn't hesitate to review that all again, even if I did it, you know, at the first visit, when it's clear they already need surgery. We'll talk about it again because, you know, I'm confident that I can have a minimal chance of that, but I also want the patient to hear it um, very explicitly, and not just you know in a piece of paper. Definitely. So, unless you guys want to add anything, do you? <laughs> Micah does. <laughs> just a brief statement, just because I work in a very different work environment and we have um, significant pressures to get tons of patients through the clinic and uh, to decrease our number of return visits. We have compressed a huge number of our follow up visits into combination new patient pre ops or combination follow up pre op appointments to keep those subsequent pre-op appointments free, um, which creates a huge number of challenges because all of that work that should happen at that pre-op visit then gets offloaded and many times patients aren't prepared to receive the information that you're going to give them about their post-operative course if you've just talked to them about surgery and they're just deciding and they haven't picked a date and they haven't really wrapped their brain around it. I have mixed feelings about that situation as a surgeon, um, and I think that it makes the periop appointment and having, I'm sorry, the perioperative time and talking to them before and after surgery and having printed documents that you can send them with to review um, very important, as well as having um, multiple ways that you check on all the details that Peter was discussing, because there is a very high chance in that kind of situation, much higher than before, that something's going to fall through the cracks. Yeah, definitely. So. I, I think that those are all good points, and I think they all point to you using that time, both in your initial visit and your preoperative visit, to um, really look at the imaging, like we're talking about, correlate that with your exam, and then discuss with the patient exactly what you're seeing so that you can set expectations. So I just have a couple of examples here. This is a patient that came in um, from an outside physician that said they had a tumor. The patient thought they had cancer that needed to come out. When you look at the scan, you say, well, maybe there's some erosion of that medial maxillary bone, but otherwise that doesn't look so bad, and maybe there's some heterogeneity. So you can use your exam. We get 
the benefit at a referral center that we often have a patient come to us with imaging, right? So you can use your imaging before you go in to see the patient and then direct your exam. So I say, well, I might be able to see something in that inferior meatus area. And then when you look in, this is what it looks like, right? So that's a fungal ball. You have a completely different conversation with the patient. And then you can plan your surgery and the patient can plan what to expect with surgery much better. The correlate to that is this type of imaging that a patient comes in, they've been referred for a mucosal. You look in endoscopically and maybe you see a little something strange, right? at that um, middle turbinate, middle meatus area, and it prompts you to get further imaging because it doesn't quite fit with what you think a mucosal should look like. And this is what your further imaging shows you. You actually have an inverted papilloma and then surrounding obstructive secretions. So you really can use your imaging and exam to change the story that a patient comes to you expecting to hear and what you might expect from some outside notes that you've been given. So using things like that and then everything that was just said, of course, realistic expectations, set your goals of surgery, and the informed consent is really so important. Um, and this, you know, everything that we're talking about here, I hope that all of you who don't do sinus surgery and don't ever plan to do sinus surgery realize this isn't just sinus surgery, right? It's all surgery. This counts for all surgery. So even though um, we're talking about very specific things. These general things are things that for any surgery that you do, you should be thinking about doing in your initial and, and preoperative visits. The preoperative assessment, I agree. I really like that we separate it out from when we initially see a patient because having that separate time to really go over again all the possible risks and go again over everything that they need to be doing after surgery really allows the patient to have the exact right expectations cut down on those calls that you know you might get from patients afterwards and, and they really know what to do. So the other thing that uh, I think is important at that preoperative visit is really updating a medical history. Because sometimes we see patients who, you know, maybe I saw them two months ago and that's my wait time for surgery. And in that time, they went to their primary care doctor, got sent to a cardiologist, now they're on warfarin and I had no idea, right? So you have to just update that whole medical history when you go there. And then think about the need for antibiotics or steroids in that particular patient population. The bleeding risk we talked about, ginkgo, vitamin E, we know all these things that a patient might not necessarily tell you about because they don't consider it medication. So you think about those things. And then the checklist. The CT checklist I think is, at least for this particular type of surgery, a very important thing for you to do preoperatively just making sure that you have the right patient that's been sent to you. I have had scans sent to me with medical records that were not actually that patient's scan. The patient tells me, someone said I was missing bone in the back of my sphenoid and I look at the scan and it doesn't show that at all. And you just have to make sure that you actually have been sent the correct scan for that patient. So consistent review, this is a, a question for you guys. Do you have a particular method of going through a CT? I teach the residents my method, but I'm sure everyone has their own method. So starting with you, Karen, what are the, what is your method of going through a scan so that you make sure that you don't miss anything? Well, I, I'm sure it's pretty similar um, to yours. I look, um, you know, I look at the scans, like you had confirmed the patient, the side, um, you know, I look at the, um, the non-sinus structures. Um, um, I look through all of the sinuses. I usually will scroll the coronals from, you know, anterior to posterior. And then I like to look at the axials too um, as well. And then, you know, look at the level of the skull base. Um, if I'm doing sphenoid surgery, I'm going to be looking at things like vascular structures, like your carotids and um, optic nerves. And uh, look for things like anode cells. And then look at orbital structures as well. Um, um, and, you know, any other kind of unusual things. And then, you know, depending on this, what kind of scan it is, you know, looking at things outside of, you know, taking a look at things that are sort of outside of the sinuses too. Um, but, you know, primarily those structures along this, you know, the places we get into the biggest trouble. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just put out there what my method is. and. And you guys can tell me any other differences. So I, I, I always go with the coronal. I feel like I get the most information out of that. I start from the front. I start scrolling my way back. 
And as I'm scrolling back, I'm looking at all the sinuses that come into view. So usually it's frontals, ethmoids, maxillaries, going back through the posterior ethmoids, the sinuses. I'm looking at the nasal cavity, the septum, and the turbinates as I scroll back as well. And then as I scroll from back to front, I start looking at those important structures right around the sinus cavity. So I look at my optic nerves and my carotid arteries. I make sure they're not dehiscent. I look at the skull base as they come forward. I make sure that there's no asymmetry or what the depth is. And I look at the lamina, papricia, and I look at my frontal sinus drainage pathway. And that allows me to sort of have a method of going from front to back, back to front. And I've looked at all of those really important structures around it. And then certainly soft tissue around that. Anything else to add? I actually strongly believe in making a grid. So I do like the Lund Mackay type scoring, and I look at each individual, but not quantitative, but a qualitative evaluation. So I look at the right, and I look at the left, and I have a diagram so that I have that as a flash reference. If I have a couple cases or two cases more, I'm like, which one was it that had the onodi, or uh, where is it? And then after looking at the standard structures for each of that, then looking at the you know, in the anterior ethmoids, I'm looking at anterior ethmoid artery and sphenoid at the OCR. So that's kind of how I do it and how I'm, how I have it physically organized. That's great. So this is, this part is mostly for the residents. I'm going to run pretty quickly through some important anatomy that you should be looking for on your scan. So obviously identify high risk situations, any altered anatomy from prior surgery or disease processes. When you're looking at what's dehiscent, things like the nasolacrimal ducts might not necessarily pop out to you. You think about getting into that maybe further down when you're taking your incident, but it can be dehiscent further up, and so you should be aware of that. You should think about howler cells in the maxillary sinus, and also not just if they're present, but if they're attached to that infraorbital nerve, because certainly you can cause damage by going too lateral with that. You should think about your skull base. So, um, sorry, you can think about atelectasis. You should think about your skull base. You should think about the depth. Knowing the exact numbers is not that important, except for maybe your in-service or boards, but really thinking about how is this going to affect my risk during surgery and thinking about asymmetry, because that's probably the most risky situation. You have muscle memory. You think the skull base is going to be the same way on one side or another, but it's not necessarily going to. You want to obviously look at integrity of that lamina, integrity of the skull base. You want to look at your anterior ethmoid artery position. We talk a lot about this being out of the skull base that's more risky, and you have to think about that. Posterior ethmoid artery, we don't talk that much about, but certainly I have seen some out of the skull base that isn't posterior ethmoids, and if you're not aware of that, you can get bleeding there. Position of the ostium and branches of your SPA, uh, you can see that in some situations where you're entering your sphenoid ostium, you're directed straight at your carotid artery. And so if you're entering in with a little bit more force than you should be, you could be setting yourself up for a catastrophic complication. The other thing to remember about is the high percentage of dehiscences. This is, you know, there's multiple different percentages in the literature, but in some series, as high as 20% of your carotid arteries are going to be dehiscent. That's very high. And then intersinus septum inserts onto the bony canal in 37.5%. So especially if you're entering the sphenoid to do something within the sphenoid, a CSF leak repair, just connecting it for bad recalcitrant disease when we go to the skull base beyond, and you're, you're operating on that septation, you have to think about that. You have to think about onodi cells. You know, you might not necessarily be in the sphenoid when you're encountering your optic nerve, but you need to know where it is. And you have to think also about dehiscence of the optic nerve. 12.5% of those are dehiscent. The frontal outflow paths. I like to recreate really in my mind when I'm looking at a scan in three dimensions, a three-dimensional what I'm going to see endoscopically as I do that dissection. If you look at all your three cuts and you, you think about it carefully, you can know the cells that you are going to encounter and the pathway that you need to take into that frontal sinus. And it really helps you plan your dissection and make sure that you don't leave cells behind, that you don't cause scarring or any osteogenesis. Obviously, posterior table integrity is important to look at. And then just identifying those structures at greater risk when there is a dehiscence and you have disease all around it, perhaps you want to think about getting further imaging. The other thing is if you have some sort of disease process that isn't straightforward, maybe you have to think a little bit harder about your approaches or whether you want to bring another team in to be involved with those surgeries. So we're going to move on now to the operating room. What techniques do you guys use once you are in the operating room setting 
to avoid complications. Karen, let's start with you. <laughs> well, I think um, so. Really important, obviously, is to make sure you have your scan in the room all the time, um, and that it that you know it's oriented properly. You have the right patient, etc. Um, that if you're going to use image guidance, um, that you know you make sure that it's again everything's working. Um, I think probably the one of the biggest issues just to make sure you have everything that you need when you start um, and that you're prepared for. Um, you, you know, you're hoping you're not going to have any complications, but you want to make sure that you're prepared just in in case that you do, because you know, you know that if you do enough surgeries, at some point you may run into one of these things. Um, and um, I think the other thing um, that is really key is to make sure that you have excellent visualization throughout the case. Um, so to control um, bleeding, um, you know, is one of the one of the big issues. Uh, yeah, I'm speaking to that. Uh, I, I think uh, those who've been in the operating room with me, um, I, I say that you always have to um, uh, make sure you clear your, your drip spaces. So the nasopharynx always has to be cleared. Um, and then each si each landmark that you've new newly identified, so let's just say the macular sinus, you clear that so that the blood can, from that procedure or the secretions can go into those spaces so that you can keep operating. But that way you also always have, can re-identify your landmarks, can always reset, refocus, and start from zero. Um, you know, just little things. Just make sure that your scope is always at 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock and straight. And and uh, anytime you get, uh, you're not sure um, where that, where you, where you might be oriented, you have to just reset, refocus, clear the scope, and start from scratch. And you know, and uh, and start and find your landmark again. Find the middle turbinate. Find the maxer sinus and go again. So it's just um, little things that again bring you back. Just every surgery has its major landmarks. You have to always have that in, in our in sinus surgery. And then, you know, controlling the surgical field, like uh, Karen was saying, I mean, making sure that that map is controlled, making sure the head of bed is a little bit elevated. Um, if you can, get warm saline irrigations, things like that, little tricks that can control hemostasis. Um, some people use injections, some don't, uh, of uh, epinephrine to try to get more vasoconstriction, things like that that'll allow the case to go on smoother for a longer amount of time. Um, all those things can help you. Can, our eyes are the, are the tip of the scope, three millimeter, four millimeter eyes. So we have to keep those clear and um, mucus and blood free as long as possible so we can have the best visualization possible, so we can have uh, the best outcomes for our patients. Um, just comments, a couple comments on the visualization. Uh, topical epinephrine we definitely use. That's an excellent way of avoiding complications. It's also a potential to create complications if it's drawn up in a syringe and handed to you. Um, so we stay in ours yellow. Um, I think I talked about this at one of our M&Ms, but in case you weren't there, we have navigated to the wrong patient because registration was accepted on a, the wrong CT scan. So the wrong patient was calibrated to the patient on the table. And it was only discovered when I was in there saying, that's not the sphenoid sinus. <laughs> Either I'm wrong or the computer's wrong. So we got to figure which way and it was the wrong patient. Um, so even under the best of circumstances, things can go wrong. And so I think that's sort of what I would say is, you know, right now as a resident, I mean, a lot of times we tell you what to do and you're waiting for the next step, but what we also encourage you to do is really start to develop your own sense of a plan. And you know, when, when if I leave you to operate by yourself, I am doing that intentionally not to abandon you, but to put you in that situation where you are the driver. You know, it's like student driver versus driving. Um, you know, you have to kind of scan the horizon. And so you can't just be focused on, on the screen because you have to have one eye on the eyes to see if there's like swelling in the eyes or if they're turning purple, you may be the only person that finds that out. You may be the only person who figures out that the map is 95 when you're having a bleeding problem. So when I'm in the room, I'm doing all that. You know, you think I'm just checking my email, but <laughs> I'm doing all that. And 
that helps minimize complications, but that transfer of that um, kind of that sense of surveillance is something that uh, is very important as you become the, the captain of the ship. I might just add that I think it's really important to stick to your goals of each portion of the surgery so that you accomplish your uh, your objectives for each portion of the surgery. So you do your maxillary anatrostomy and you get that done and you get it done right. And then you move on to your anterior ethmoid and you really identify the lamina so that as you go into the posterior ethmoid you aren't having the tunnel effect. And I think that's one thing I see in residents as they progress on and I've seen in myself as I've you know gone on in years of training that really sticking uh, in practice, sticking to the um, the objectives of each area and really defining those borders can be exceptionally helpful of, um, of being safe. Wonderful. So I'm just going to go over some things that you guys have already mentioned. So there is a sinus surgery specific checklist that's been sort of created and it includes things like correct imaging being displayed in the room and reviewing the anatomy and having your image guidance if it's needed for that case making sure you have all the correct surgical equipment in the room. We've had cases where we put people to sleep only to realize that we didn't have that piece of equipment that was necessary to perform that procedure and that's never a situation you want to be in. You want to plan for hemostasis like we've all mentioned, the topical epinephrine or a particular injection, um, making sure that the blood pressure is controlled, labeling of medications is really important. Control of bleeding is what we talk about a lot in sinus surgery because it's such a vascular space, right? The nose is one of the most vascular places in the body and that is unfortunately what leads to a lot of complications is when that's interfering with your ability to see where you are and what you're doing. So we've talked about how to bed elevation, the type of anesthesia can sometimes be helpful, the different vasoconstrictive agents that you choose to use. And then creating a surgical plan like you just said following the same steps each and every time and then continuing to review that CT and correlate it back and forth with what you're doing and making sure that you're exactly where you want to be and that you don't have the wrong patient's image <laughs> navigating with this patient. So this is, you know, something we commonly see sent to us who have, people who have had surgery on the outside who have had um, their maxillary sinuses open. It's probably one of the most common things we see is recirculation, right? So you just want to identify that. Um, Beforehand, you want to prevent that from ever being your patient. You want to make sure that you're using angled cameras so that you are looking all the way over. You want to identify the natural ostium first before you open that with the rest of the maxillary sinus and then you can be sure that you didn't miss it. If you do see later on someone with recirculation, then certainly it's simple enough to take down that residual incident that was left behind and remove that scar band so that at the end of the surgery, what you should always see for maxillary sinus is this nice pear-shaped ostium. When you're, you know, thinking globally about sinus surgery, meticulous dissection, I think we all think that's, that's really important, whatever surgery you're doing, but it can decrease mucosal stripping, which then decreases bleeding and decreases healing time. Complete your ethmoidectomy, like you said, bring it all the way to the lamina before you move forward. That just allows you to visualize things more. So what if you're in the middle of surgery, you've thought you've been doing all these things and right now we're talking kind of globally, we're going to get into specifics in a second, but what do you do if something bad suddenly happens? What would you advise the residents if something bad suddenly happens? What would their initial steps be? <laughs> Peter, please do tell. <laughs> He can do it. <laughs> well, I think you immediately, I mean, this is just like seeing a patient in the ED in the trauma bay, you know, you're immediately trying to categorize the urgency of the situation. So, you know, is this a carotid bleed or is this, you know, an IMAX bleed? Uh, is this venous bleeding? Okay, so just in your mind, get that straight. Is the patient unstable? You know, is there, do I have five minutes, 15 minutes, or 30 minutes to get help? Um, so that's obviously the first thing, and it depends on the complication. Yeah. But I think everybody in this room has that ability to make that kind of a judgment. It's not to say that you know exactly what to do next. And certainly if you're the resident, I don't expect you to, but I expect you to know 
that you need to call me with a level of urgency based on your assessment, and I think everybody can do that. So that's probably the, the first thing. And then obviously to stop what you're doing and secure the patient. Uh, if you don't know what the status of it is, you don't know what's wrong. So sometimes it's mysterious, you know, hypotension and you don't know what happened, then secure the patient, take a pause, don't do anything else, and then bring in experts to help you so that you're not the only one trying to figure it out. So another bad is yellow bad, which is seeing fat. So what happens when you suddenly see fat that you're not expecting to see? Or deep red, which is maybe muscle, which is orbital muscle. So that's a different type of stress. It's a different type of concern. And the different uh, level of blood pressure issue for me. So, um, so that's, I think, some uh, situation where I think the first thing you should do is Palpate the eye, <laughs> right? You got to palpate the eye as quickly as possible. You know, sort of you want to see that that you want to make sure that that eye is not protruding, rock hard. Possibly that in the process of whatever process happened that led to that exposure of orbital contents didn't somehow lead to exposure or nicking of uh, anterior ethmoid or posterior ethmoid artery, which may have retracted already into the orbit and caused uh, that catastrophic issue and urgent issue, which again leads to a several minute kind of rapid fire sequence, um, canthotomy, cantholysis situation, which we've talked about. So um, versus, okay, everything's soft. All right, now we can think about this. What's happened? Let's analyze this. Um, this is simple. Um, and then we can talk about the ways of managing that. But again, assessment, uh, initial steps need to be addressed, thought about. We've all uh, discuss those, immediate management of bleeding, immediate management of, and severe bleeding, moderate bleeding, minor bleeding, um, immediate management of fat um, and orbital uh, complications, B uh, bad ones or minor ones. All right, we have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna move forward a little bit. But yes, when things are not going according to plan, you take a deep breath. Your, your blood pressure and your anxiety levels suddenly goes up and, and you don't want that to be the state that you're making decisions in. So you just take a step back, take a deep breath, and then think about all the things that were just discussed, right? You recognize the issue. You admit that, that that happened. You don't want something bad to have happened, but you have to recognize it and then be able to say, okay, that happened. What is the next step that I do? Don't ignore it. If you saw a little bit of clear fluid out, out in that corner, don't just keep going. Really, really investigate it. Really see what's going on and, and repair it whatever the complication is, if possible, but if you don't know how to repair it or you don't know what's going on, exactly like they just said, you call a colleague. You call one of us, or once you're out on your own, you call someone that maybe knows more about how to handle that. That's the best way to go about keeping a complication as minor as possible, because if you don't do any of those things, you can take a minor complication and make it into a big, bad, major complication. Yes, birding. So, um, so these are things that have already been kind of mentioned. So control of bleeding. So certainly artery ligation, whether it's anterior ethmoid or sphenopalatine, you wanna have your bipolar and suction cautery available, topical hemostatic agents. Um, you know, sometimes just taking a little bit more bone off of the orbit allows you to clip an anterior ethmoid artery instead of having to go externally. If you have damaged that more medially, then you have that ability instead of allowing it to retract into the eye, that's something to consider. Let's talk a little bit about carotid injury. This is not something that you typically see during sinus surgery, it's more a skull-based problem, but unfortunately, like that first case I showed you, we have seen this happen just during sinus surgery. So things like packing, not packing too hard so that you occlude the whole artery, but packing enough that you um, occlude the, what's bleeding, using crushed muscle over an injury, using direct control like a U-clip if you can see where it's going, and then of course going to interventional radiology after you've been able to manage the patient. So hopefully that was an impressive video for you guys. But now you might notice something's weird about that blood. It's like a little watery. <laughs> so this is a, a video from a vascular injury training course where they set up, there's lots of different courses now that are out there. Some are just using you know, red dyed saline. Some actually use sheep and have a sheep bleed out if you can't, if you can't control it. But, these are good ways for you to get into that situation yourself 
allow yourself to feel that heightened blood pressure when you have a red out of your screen and then understand what to do, how to position your suction to direct that blood flow away from your camera so that you can then understand what to do to control that bleed. So Zara, I can ask you, what, what, what would you do? So after you, let's say that happened and now you've gotten suction so you can sort of see the pulsation, what's the first thing you would so place? The first thing would be to gently pack that artery. You can use lots of different things. Probably what I use most, well, like, like most in all my carotid <laughs> artery injuries. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, what I have used in the one carotid injury that I um, saw at, uh, at Emory was we used pledgets. We gently packed off that, um, that carotid, not enough to occlude. Uh, and then you take that patient to the interventional suite. Now, since that time, uh, certainly what I've learned and what I've seen other people demonstrate is that you can harvest muscle, you can crush it, you can put it on as a patch. But even after you do that, which actually surprisingly controls a carotid artery bleed very well, you still want to go to the IR suite because just leaving that muscle patch there might control the bleeding right then, but you often will see pseudoaneurysms or aneurysms develop after the fact. So you still want to go to the IR suite after that. Anyone? Yeah. So I've been in that situation and working with a neurosurgeon. And I will say the thing I learned was that neurosurgeons don't know how to manage carotid totally. bleeding in the sphenoid sinus anywhere near you. So if you think that you're just there to show the view and on, no, you are it, you're on when that happens. Okay, so all this stuff is really practical. And you know, I, I mean, I remember this when this happened, it happened here and uh, like the suction went out. You know, <laughs> right when we were trying it's to figure out. Doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, okay, so what do you do? I, I did the same thing, pledges. And how many times have I put a pledget into the back of the nose? Just like in my sleep, my muscle memory kicked in and I just did it, you know? And, and that's what will happen. You just, you won't really know you have it in you. It's, you know, the Wizard of Oz, it's like it's in you the whole time, but you'll, you'll call on that. And, but it's all these cumulative experiences of the non-stress situations when you do these things. You know, when we tell you like, okay, be really careful where you place this or that, you know, uh, don't bump into this and, you know, place this, and all that is building your muscle memory for this kind of a situation. And when all else, all else fails, if pledges don't work, and I've done that before, or massive JNA bleeding, um, Curlex, using the pharynx for bleeding, you can actually shove it in the nose and it will stop the bleeding. And then eventually you can slowly remove it and then you can slowly find the bleeder, but eventually, I mean, it'll stop it. All right, we're gonna keep going. Hydrogenic CSF leak. Um, this is another thing that you, you don't ever want to see happen, but can happen. So things that I use, and then I wanna hear from you guys. You know, good hemostasis, hopefully that would avoid that complication, but if you see that, then good hemostasis around it really allows you to see it better. Avoid injury to surrounding structures, like for example, the brain behind, and then if you can, if you know it, you identify it, it's small, you know how to repair it, you can complete your sinus surgery. You can you know, do what you came to do. And then expose the entire bony defect. You want to remove the surrounding mucosa. Usually just a mucosal overlay is enough. Do you guys have anything to add to that? Step, step by step pathway. So now Dr. Nyack actually very nicely already kind of touched on this, but Orbital injury is something, you know, really, really um, terrible that can happen uh, during sinus surgery. And unfortunately, even in this day and age where we think, oh, people have been using microdebreeders for so long, they know how to use it. That's certainly not necessarily always the case. So, you know, communication with your OR team, making sure that, you know, if it, as you're operating, someone else maybe is palpating the eye if you're right next to the eye or watching the eye making sure that residents and students and other people around you are, are also looking at that. And then, you know, there's lots of different levels, like you mentioned, of ophthalmologic injury. And so obviously having the experts come on in and, and let you know what they think, check the intraocular pressures, check for the afferent pupillary defect, that's often the first sign of some sort of orbital injury that you'll see. And then canthotomy and cantholysis. So Dr. Nayak also mentioned this. Um, do you want to go ahead and talk, talk us through this image here about 
how, how I mean, to do this? This is actually very, extremely hard to do um, in the actual setting because everything is swollen and um, uh, really uh, in, enlarged and engorged. But uh, uh, again, you just want to take a, a kind of a tenotomy scissor, go in through the, the lateral canthus, just make at least a, a one inch or one or two centimeter incision, just straight laterally 90 degrees towards the tragus, okay, in the lateral canthus. And just don't worry about the incision. Don't worry about cosmesis or anything like that. This heals them remarkably well, uh, cosmetically favorably. And if it doesn't, there's oculoplastics uh, that will take care of it. Um, no, seriously, they're, they're, it's very easy to do. It, it's like a 15-minute procedure to them. It's not a problem. Uh, but I've had, I've been in a situation um, uh, one or two times. Thankfully, only once um, because of my own patient. I've uh, helped in a few other settings, and uh, they've scheduled the surgery three times. They've canceled it twice because it looks so good. Um, just naturally. So anyway, and then you can turn the scissors down 90 degrees and do the cantalysis, just making sure the inferior lid, the, 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 the lower lid can retract out. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So that's basically um, talking about those big catastrophes. Obviously, we also want to, you know, avoid inadequate surgery over aggressive surgery that can lead to long-term complications. So in our last like few minutes, we're going to talk really quickly about postoperative management because certainly what you do after surgery can affect what happens. There's multiple reasons for failure. One of the main things that we see is the most common complication after surgery is just sneaky eye scarring within the nose. So doing things like just making sure that your middle turbinate is medialized. This is something that I've adopted now doing a suture technique to keep those middle turbinates medialized. I used to do nothing. and. Uh, most of the time it was fine. Sometimes there'd be a scar band here or there, but I've seen that since I've started doing this, I haven't had any scar bands to deal with, and the, the patients, you know, are really able to clear out that cavity with rinses really well, and um, there's been, really no, been, been no problem with scarring since that time. So it's a very easy, simple procedure you can do, even without a septoplasty. You go through the cartilage in front of the turbinates, through that very thin posterior bone behind the turbinates, and just medialize them together. Um, so what do you guys do, if anything, in our last few minutes, last minute? <laughs> Atraumatic technique, above all. So look at the lateral surface of your middle terminate end of your cadaver dissection or your live surgery and 